you guys are here for the what is the certification process and much much more you're in the right spot if you're not sit back hold on and uh, Bill Rawlings from Maryland Department of Ag is going to uh, share with you the, the certification process so thanks a lot Bill. yes thank you oh okay. uh, good afternoon I'm Bill Rawlings with the Maryland Department of Agriculture uh, I got right after lunch so hopefully I don't put you to bed um, or to sleep uh, but I do see we have a better uh, oh, group than one time I gave a speech out in Garrett County. There was two people that sat in. So, uh, so um, what is the certification process? Um, there's a five steps to the certification process. The first would be the organic system plan, which is there we go, um, which is what the producer is in charge of filling out the organic system plan. What are you going to grow? How are you going to grow it? What uh, management practices are you going to use? Um, then you would mail the organic system plan to the Maryland Department of Agriculture or whatever certifier you choose. Um, they would review it, make sure that it was complete, that it uh, complied with the National Organic Program standards. And <clears throat> if everything was there, then they'd call you up, contact you some way, uh, say this schedule and inspection will come out, look at your processes, make sure that you're doing what, you're, what you put on the OSP. So you got the inspection. Um, then a final review where someone back at the office or wherever it may be is looking to make sure that what the inspector observed is what you put on your organic system plan. And then the certification decision would be made. Bill, are yes. we able to ask questions while you go on or wait till the end? No, right. go ahead. So, in other words, when we send an AOSP, we're also sending in our check for 500 bucks. Yes, sir. Forgot that part. <laughs> yes. Well, I was making it general. The Maryland Department of Agriculture charges $500. Uh, you would send that in with the application. Uh, <clears throat> they do not trust us with money anymore, so you take the front page of the organic system plan off, you send your check to a P.O. box in Baltimore, and you send us the application. Uh, so that's the, that's the submittal uh, procedure. Um, so the organic system plan, we have a section for general, general information, your farm plan, what are you planning on growing, uh, seeds and seed treatments, uh, seedlings and planting stock if you're doing vegetables, soil and crop fertility management, crop management, maintenance of organic integrity, uh, record keeping system, and your labeling. Uh, so the general information would be what's the name of your operation, uh, the name of whoever's in charge of the operation, uh, the address, uh, other contact information, phone number, fax number, um, email, if you have a, a website. Then the legal status of the business in, so are you a sole proprietorship? If you're a corporation or a, a partnership, we need the names of everyone involved. Uh, and that's due to some federal rules that we need to make sure that who's making our the certification decision doesn't have something to do with your business because that would be a conflict of interest. Um, then uh, directions to the farm. So uh, if it's pretty state straightforward, you don't need many directions. If you got to go back this road and then over to this road to find your farm and you don't have like a physical address, then that would be where the directions would come in. Um, and then have you ever been certified before? If you have, you need to claim it um, because we're supposed to check with previous certifiers to make sure that there wasn't a um, issue in your previous certification that we would have to make sure that you addressed before granting certification. And it also ask if you'd been denied. Um, so the farm plan, what crops are you going to plant? So if you're going to plant uh, wheat, barley, 
corn, soybeans, or are you going to plant mixed vegetables? And <clears throat> due to uh, size, if you're just a, about an acre vegetable farm, it's better to say that you're planting mixed vegetables than 200 square foot of potatoes and 100 square foot of tomatoes. So if you're small scale, just mix it. If you're planting 10 acres of tomatoes, then that's where uh, this section would come in. And we have crops broken down. So there's a line for wheat, a line for corn. You would put your uh, field number, how many acres, what your projected yield would be. Um, so we just went over that. Uh, projected yield. Um, date of transition. So um, organic requires a three-year transition. So this say yesterday, March the 8th, you went out and applied Roundup, which a little early to do that, but anyway. Uh, so March of 2018, on the 8th, you applied a prohibited substance. In three years, which would be March 8, 2021, you would be allowed to harvest an organic crop from that field if you didn't apply any other prohibited material to the field. I have a question about that. Yes. So, in other words, it's not from the date you sent in the OSP, it's from the date you last put a prohibited product on the field. Correct. It's three years from that date you can get your organic certification. Yes, sir. And not from the date you sent in your application. Correct. So, um, we allow land use, uh, land use affidavits. So if you, we have a form for it. So if you've managed the property for three years and you say, eh, in my records, the last date that I applied this, uh, a prohibited substance was this date, and um, well, we would, we can accept that. Um, if you purchased land recently and the previous owner is willing to attest to when they last uh, applied a prohibited substance, um, they could sign the land use affidavit and you could submit that with your application. Yes? So that <clears throat> you could still harvest a crop that, I mean, you might have applied something early in the season, but still harvest that crop and it starts from the date you applied that uh, prohibited substance? Correct. Okay. So, yeah, if if you applied, let's say soybeans, because they're Roundup ready. You plant them, you go in there and spray them, and then next year you're like, I want to be organic. It would be the date that you applied the Roundup. So, yes? What if um, you have structures on, on the land that you want to certify organic that had like treated lumber on them? Let's go with... Pretend you have a stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. that you had used to trellis tomatoes that was treated. Nice. Before we would say three years. Right. Now there's a draft guidance in the NOP's uh, handbook yeah. that hasn't been approved yet, but that says that treated pro uh, wood is not a prohibited material, but you cannot use it after you become certified. So it's, it's right now we'd go with three years, but if that draft guidance ever got passed, it would be the day before you uh, submitted your application. Three to years say. from what though for that field? Would you, I mean, would you um, you whenever you put that stake in the ground. So let's say you were uh, going to do a pasture uh -huh. and you put up high tensile fence treated post. Uh -huh. If you did that application of the fence post, putting the fence post in the ground, three years after that, we would certify you. So if I bought a, new pe if I bought a piece of land that had a, like a fence post again or whatever, like that was installed more than three years ago. It I would be grandfathered in. Grandfather. Okay, yep. that helps, thank you. Mm -hmm. And can you, you're allowed to use plastic mulch, right? Yes, it has to be removed after the growing season yeah. and you don't want, um, plastic mulch that's uh, got leachable PVC in it. That's in the standards. Uh, 
usually the ones that we run across are not uh, do not have that problem. So, but as long as you remove it after the growing season, we've uh, seen a lot of these biodegradable mulches coming on the market now. Yes. Uh, a couple years ago, the NOP made an allowance for biodegradable mulches, but their allowance. Uh, there is not a biodegradable mulch on the market that complies with their <laughs> regulations. So. Is that because of the source of it? Like it has to be non-GMO corn-based plastic, right? Um, usually they have some type of synthetic product in it that is not approved. Oh, so it wasn't about the source. Right. Okay. So parcel information. And <clears throat> if you take anything from this, Parcel information is important. So, if you're a split oper if you're a split operation, and uh, you're doing conventional corn and organic corn, in the parcel information they ask for your field location or your field number, the address, and then how many acres. So you want to say. Let's say field one is conventional, so field one, your address, and how many acres are conventional. And then field two is going to be organic, so the address, how many acres. And you can lump them together by operation, so field one, uh, three, and five are conventional. You'd write them down on one line, record them as conventional. But this is to give us an idea of where things are located and also to locate these fields. So like if you have different farms, it's important for us to be able to say these addresses are organic and under your management. And can you have your organic field here and your conventional field budding it? You need a um, you need an adequate buffer. So it depends on what you're growing and how your your management techniques. So if you're coming in and spraying with an airplane, you're going to need a bigger buffer than if you're not spraying at all, but you're growing something that is conventional. So with, depending on your management practices is how wide that needs to be. So yes? Can you use um, your regular row crops as a buffer and then just not sell them organic? Conventional? If you if you planted a, your organic product product up to your conventional one and then harvested it, you could, but you're going to have to document how much you harvested it, uh, a cleaning of the whatever you used to harvest between. So you're going to have to clean the machine between your buffer. And your organic. What is that size of that buffer? Adequate. Adequate. I like that. That's so, very big. Um, <laughs> usually, feet, we're usually around 20, 20 to 30. So, it depends on the risk. Um, if you had uh, organic corn next to conventional corn, uh, some places say 600 foot. Like a term yeah. So it depends. We've had cases. We had a case where they were right beside each other. So we took a residue sample, make sure there wasn't any contamination. Uh, but we can't be. Your plan needs to be sufficient to protect the integrity. So it's it's a plan issue when you have corn right next to conventional corn, because you're not, it's not trying to prevent. Cross pollination? Right, like you need the, you need the plan for that. You need more uh, space in between them. So it's kind of, it's one of them things, it's, it's a case by case basis. Yes? I have a question, I guess. Um, are you at all liable as an organic? Uh, it, it's hard, but if if they 
if someone drifted on your property and it would be a considered a prohibited product and you would have to retransition. Would you assume at that point that your buffer wasn't adequate? That happened? No. Can you see them? You can do whatever you like. Okay. Because we've we had a case where something was sprayed and the owner and the people that sprayed it wasn't it didn't involve us but it was one of our producers and they had to work it out so it has happened in Maryland and the uh, producer and the party that sprayed worked it out um, you could portion it off depending on what extent it was contaminated so if it's a hundred acres and they only got the first 20 foot then you could just move your buffer so okay and then you also claim if the land is rented or owned on the parcel information and why I was going over this a lot of people admit it like they just go right past it so each part of the application it's important for you to fill out um, if you don't think it applies to you, may, maybe write a little sentence of why it doesn't apply to you to justify not filling out a section. But um, you should try to put as much detail into the organic system plan as possible. So um, seeds and seed treatments, yes. You can, in other words, say we apply for the organic certification, yes. right? Because it's been three years and I'm going to self-certify my fields are ready. Okay. And I've sent you my application and my 500 bucks. Can I then claim at that point I'm organically grown on labeling? No. I have to uh, wait for your approval, right? Right. See, there's an exemption. And a, the exemption is under $500 or $5,000 you do not have to be certified. So if you're a small operation, you could sell your product as organic as long as you weren't selling more than five hundred or five thousand dollars in organic product. Is that gross profit or net profit? That is sales. sales. So there might be a loophole to say that you're organic until you get the certification, but if you're a big scale, like if you're going to a farmer's market, you can sell it as organic. If you're selling to Hanover Foods, they're not going to take it without a certificate. And s harvest of an organic crop cannot happen until you have certification. So if, if you're a dairy farm and you're not certified and you go out there and chop your corn, then that's not organic and you can't feed it to your organic cows. So. Um, What's the turnaround time once we submit the application to the approval? If we have everything in line on the farm and your inspectors come out and say, yep, yeah, they're doing exactly what they said. Ideally, two to three months, like from receiving the application because we all have different duties that we do. Um, so it takes time to review it, takes time to set up the inspection, someone to come into the office and review do the final review and then the decision. Um, if it gets complicated, six months. So if you got everything in order and it's plain as day and night, not long. If things start getting confusing, uh, maybe things weren't done correctly, you don't have all your records, uh, six months or so. Yes? And then is the inspection normally done during the growing season? It varies. Um, ideally, it would. Uh, we're supposed to do the initial inspection within six months of receiving the OSP. Um, and then after that, within 18 months between inspections. So, moving on the seeds. Uh, so, you, there's three different sources for seeds. You can have organic, you can have non-treated, or you could save your own. So if you're not organic yet, your seeds are still non-treated most likely. Um, but uh, 
the organic standards say that you must use organic unless not commercially available. So some of these, you'll have a seed list in your organic system plan. Uh, you'd want to direct uh, address the variety, the source, if it's organic, the certifier. So if you're buying from Johnny's, it's going to be a certain certifier. If you're buying from Seedway, it's going to be another certifier. Um, so you'd want to go off the seed tag. Uh, if there's seed treatment, uh, you'd want to address what type. So some of the clovers, um, there's some pelletized like carrot seeds, they're going to have a seed treatment. You want to address that on your organic system plan. And that's to verify that that's allowed. The only time that uh, seed treatments are allowed that might not be organically approved is if it's required by federal law. Um, you, you also want to document if you're using GMO seeds, so if you're split operation into one conventional corn, uh, you'd want to note that as well. Um, and then if you're using non-organic seeds, like let's say you, it gets late in the season, you're out trying to find wheat and you can't find organic wheat seed, uh, you need to call around the three places and that's not calling southern states, uh, let's say uh, Willards and like play, don't call places that you know aren't going to have organic seeds. You need to search some places that would have organic seeds because it kind of, it's, you're not justifying it if you're pl calling places that you know do not have organic seeds. Um, planting stock and seedlings. Um, are you growing or buying your seedlings and planting stock? Uh, if you're growing them, what methods are you using? What type of soil? Um, are you using any, uh, using any fertility products, uh, foliar sprays, um, pest or disease management products on those transplants? Um, are you planting directly into the ground? Uh, is there treated wood in your greenhouse? Um, what type of equipment are you using? Uh, uh, the pest management um, and then soil fertility products used. So, um, organic system plan for uh, soil and crop fertility. Um, what is your plan to improve the soil? The National Organic Program standards requires that you maintain or improve your soil quality and as farmers you don't want to deplete your soil because your yield's going to start going like that. So uh, you want to maintain that soil or hopefully improve it. Uh, Um, if you're using restricted products, uh, how are you using them? So uh, micronutrients, uh, a lot of those are synthetic, but they're allowed under the uh, national list. So if you're, you need magnesium or manganese, zinc, one of those products, you just have to have the soil test showing our level is getting low. This crop needs an adequate amount of zinc in order to thrive. So we're going to add zinc to the field. Who determines what flow is? I mean. uh, soil test or um, you can do leaf cultures. I've seen a couple uh, leaf cultures and it's kind of interesting. Like you take an older leaf from the bottom and you take a newer leaf from the top and it, you can see the difference in the nutrients in, this, um, in the plant. Yes? How about compost? We need to look at what you're using. If it doesn't have animal materials in it, um, it's kind of free game. Mm -hmm. You can use it at any time. If you have animal materials, it has to meet a certain composting requirement mm -hmm. or it has to be treated as manure. Manure um, that you apply to a field, if, if the crop comes in contact with the soil, you have to plant, uh, apply it 120 days before. If the crop does not come in contact like sweet corn, then it's 90 days before harvest. How 
about um, quantity? Of manure? Of manure compost. Um, you need a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to 1 to 40 to 1 yes. for uh, the compost, the initial feedstock. And I mean, there's no restriction on the volume of, of compost or manure you could apply to the field? If you sell over $2,500 in product, you're required to have a nutrient management plan okay. and you need to fall, fall okay. inside that. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Do you know generally what pe what is allowed or what people don't allow, or is it just, it's really specific to the operation? It's specific to the operation. Okay. Thank you. But you can put it on pretty heavy usually because uh, it's going to be lower in nutrients. Okay. Thanks. So, yes, sir. So, for example, if your crop, if you do your soil, if you do a tissue sample of your plant, right. and you're low on boron and calcium, you can apply boron and calcium at a rate that would it's be not organically certified. Correct. Um, we're we're going to get into materials list. Okay. You would re, you would submit a materials list. We would say these products are approved, um, and then on the materials list that we send you, we'd say calcium uh, must document this deficiency. So, if you have a test showing that it, you're deficient in calcium, and then you could use that calcium on that field or that crop. It's not certified organic. Correct. I hate to ask you a bunch of questions, right. but it's my next question has to do with cover crop. Okay. Does your cover crop have to be certified organic? Our our stance is the seed that uh, you use for production has to be organic. Um, that's kind of serving a purpose, but you're not harvesting it, you're using it to build biomass or uh, add nutrients to the soil. So we've just been requiring non-treated. So it does not have to be certified? We haven't been requiring it, now. Like it's good if you use it, but uh, for the purpose that it's serving, it's kind of, we haven't been requiring it. So. Um, you would be allowed to use non-treated cover crops. Um, so we talked about the restricted products. Uh, what conservation practices are you using? So there's a great big checklist of conservation practices like uh, strip cropping. Uh, uh, probably none of you use uh, terraces, but different options of how to conserve your soil, prevent runoff, maybe uh, wash strips or greenways, whatever your uh, location calls them. Um, and then if you have a problem with erosion, what are you doing to correct that? Maybe working with the soil conservation, um, strip cropping, uh, whatever it may be. Um, and if you use water, how, like irrigation, how are you irrigating? Um, if you're cleaning your irrigation, what are you cleaning it with? Um, so uh, there's certain things that are allowed and not allowed uh, in the cleaning of irrigation because it's hard to get it out of the lines, so you don't want to be pro uh, applying a prohibited substance to your uh, crop. Uh, crop management. Um, what is your crop rotation? We require a three-year crop rotation. Um, now, it doesn't particularly have to be corn, cover crop, suey beans, cover crop, some other crop. You will, we can be flexible as long as you can prevent uh, pests and diseases. Uh, do about two years of corn in a row but we don't like to see too many years of the same crop year after year because you're going to build up pest, you're going to start to have a problem. So uh, we don't require three different crops in three years, but you need to have something in there to prevent the pest from breeding and thriving. Yes? 
So for a super small scale diversified vegetable farm, like is there is there a size that is appropriate for a crop rotation or you know, like what? I guess that's when you talk to with the certifier, but. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it, it can vary. Uh, like we like to see location. Like if you're planting uh, tomatoes in this spot this year, maybe tomatoes over there next year, so you're not getting early blade or something in the soil to uh, just transfer one down the line. So, so if you did a row rows and you just moved it like that it could jump over but if you put it over there this year and then vice versa and you need documentation of that yeah so vegetables a map each year showing what you were planting where um, if you're doing row crops like corn you can have have it written down but for vegetable producers maps usually work the best okay, thank you. Um, Crop rotation, weed management, um, address uh, what weeds you have problems with and how you, what you're working on to um, prevent them or slow them down. Maybe cultivation, flame weeding, uh, plastic mulch, something like that. Um, disease management, uh, what diseases are a problem, uh, what you're doing. And with the weeds, pest, and disease, this is where crop rotation comes into effect because if you're not rotating your crops, you could be just building that bank of whatever the pest is, uh, weed seeds. But by uh, rotating your crop and maybe plowing at a different time, you might be getting rid of some of them weed seeds. Uh, so they're just different management practices help you uh, better and organic uh, reduce your pest. Uh, and um, so each, uh, each management plan asks for what is your pest issues, uh, what are you doing to prevent them, and how would you identify that? So is, it, is your pest management excellent? Is it satisfactory? Or does it need improvement? So the maintenance of organic integrity, and this is where we kind of come into the whole uh, buffer zones, maybe equipment cleaning. So uh, joining land use, what, what your neighbor's doing, if they're planting corn, uh, what practices are you putting in place to protect your corn? Um, and that could be different planting dates. Um, are you doing parallel production? If so, uh, do you have segregate, or, uh, dedicated equipment or are you cleaning it? If you're cleaning it, what's your cleaning procedure? Um, Harvest, how are you harvesting your product? Post-harvest handling, um, are you doing any post-harvest handling? Vegetables, are you cleaning it, uh, washing it, drying it, um, putting it in a cooler? Uh, crop storage, um, and here, parallel production, if you're storing corn, do you have an area to, do you have a bin for organic corn and do you have a bin for So you can clean the leg, mm -hmm. you get it pretty clean, but there's still, you know, it's still being used to fill all the tanks. Right. So if you had a way, a compelling way that you cleaned it, that would be taken into consideration. Do you find that through the certification process that that jams up some people when they get to that area? Um, we have not had that scenario. Um, we do do some work with uh, grain in other ways, so I think that that could be a possibility. If you like had pictures, look, we got this totally clean. You just need documentation. Like, if you harvested a thousand or ten thousand bushel, and then 
your bin ends up with 12,000 bushel, we're going to start saying, did you mess up here and affect the whole crop? Um, but we have never had a organic producer that had a leg, so that's kind of new. I can't say for sure that that would pass, but it sounds it sounds adequate. So. So from a from a so when, when I'm looking at the crop storage bullet point and. Mm -hmm. The organic program is primarily interested in record keeping for just keeping crops that are organic separate from non organic crops. It's not like a food safety requirement. There's not, you know, like recording temperatures in the fridge and that, but because I know that it's covered in gap and right. stuff. But. No, we're, we're looking for segregation, uh, prevention of con contamination and commingling. Um, yes? What, what are some of the examples of equipment cleaning and like? Okay, combine. How are you cleaning your combine? So if you go from conventional to organic, what are you doing to clean that? Uh, are you running, are you purging it, running 50 bushel of corn through it to try to clean out the inside? Are you getting in there and blowing all the chaff and everything out? Um, combine's probably one of the hardest ones to clean. Now if you got a round baler, blow it off, make sure that there's no debris on it. Um, I guess maybe like a potato digger, wash it off, get all the dirt off of it. Um, it's something adequate to get the get all the debris out. So you could cl blow off your combine then purge it and uh, we'd look at that process. Or if you got in there and tried to get everything out uh, we'd look at that as well and uh, if that's reliable for cleaning all the conventional grain out. I'm sorry. No. I just, just to follow up on that, you're not required to have a specific We try to be reasonable. Okay. So if you are harvesting one day, putting it in the cooler and then taking it to the farm market the next day, mm -hmm. no. If you are harvesting a thousand pounds of sweet potatoes yeah. and distributing them over time, we'd like the, you to put, okay, we started storaging, storage here um, and be able to show that you didn't sell more than a thousand pounds of sweet potatoes. Okay. Okay. One more question. Okay. Like a propane dryer. For okay. Dry down corn. You're using the same propane dryer to dry down non organic and organic crops. Okay. Problem. I mean, as long as it's cleaned out. One of the tall rectangular ones or yeah, one of the old yeah, circle I mean, ones? Like for, for corn, soybean, wheat. I mean, probably you a get purge. It down to 15 five to store it anywhere. Right. Probably a purge would be. A purge would be sufficient. Yeah. So, did, yes, sir. You are through Maryland Department of Agriculture, right? Yes, sir. That your certifiers come from them. Right. Are they the same folks to do the farm inspections for food safety, or are they different folks? Most of them are split. They do but, both. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Was there another one over here? Uh, transportation. Um, if you're going to the farmer's market, have your own transportation, it's okay. If, if you're doing bulk uh, grains, um, usually producers will have like a, make up their own clean truck affidavit. They'll check the truck before they load it, uh, make sure that it's clean, sign all that, fill it out that the trailer was clean, who was trucking it, how much, what was put on the truck, so on and so forth, uh, to document that that was clean so the buyer has evidence that the truck was clean before it got there. Is that the same with the other procedures that you listed? Like say you're like cleaning out a combine, is that something you have to like sign off on? Like, if you yeah, you should have, have you should, yes. So when you're shipping grain, you'd want to do that to protect the integrity, show the buyer that you were being diligent 
before you loaded the truck. Now, if it's your own truck and you only use it for organic, you could have that on the invoice, but a lot of times, if they're going long ways, uh, a lot of the trucks going to Pennsylvania have a, like a contract trucker hauling the product. So, yes, ma'am. Is there like a list of, I know there is. Um, is there, there, I know there's lists of like what chemicals are allowed for cleaning things. Um, is, is there a list of like recommendations? Is that, we like share a lot of equipment with a landscaping and nursery company. Okay. And uh, it just occurred to me that maybe we should be careful about the bucket of the tractor because there might be like gravel or fill dirt or whatever that we use. I, I'm just curious, like, what would the, what's the concern and how much do we have to be vigilant? Would, would just like using like compressed air to blow out the bucket be enough to get debris out? With or do dirt, we... I'd say water, water, like a power washer. A power washer every time? In the um, Probably okay. something like that, okay. just to be safe. And is there like a document on the recommendations? I mean, it's just a special, I bet like as far as like protocols for cleaning and the power that, sounds good to me, I'm just curious. You might be able to do some research. We don't have like a standard procedure okay. because like the problem with that is it can constrict you. If you can say, we're going to do this to clean it and it sounds good, mm -hmm. we'll take it. But if we say you gotta do it this way, that you might have a different idea of what's it's more like adequate. It's that we have a plan and that we're paying attention to it. Right. Okay. That should be going to go Right. Okay. And that could be a checklist. It could be uh, a f piece of p um, paper with lines that has the date, the piece of equipment, how you cleaned it. Okay. So it, you tailor it to f fit your operation. Uh, record keeping. So, how long do you keep records? Does anyone know this? How long do you keep organic records? Three years. I don't have. Five years. Five years. No, I get that a lot. Like people will either say three years or seven years, and they'll they'll be all around it. But but it's five years as uh, laid out in the National Organic Program standards. Um, Types of record keeping field activity records. Uh, when you plow, when you, uh, when you weed, when you cultivate, uh, when you plant, how much you plant. Um, and that's a big thing. How much did you plant? If you're planting lettuce seed, did you plant an ounce? Did you plant a pound? Because that's going to come in line when we look at your records and you sold all this lettuce, but you only bought an ounce of seed. Is it sufficient to grow that amount of crop? Um, input application records, uh, when did you apply that calcium to the field and how much did you apply per acre? And then show the receipts that you bought that much calcium. Um, harvest records, what date did you harvest, how much did you harvest? Um, and there can be flexibility to harvest records, like if you're harvesting a field every three days and you say from this, uh, this date to this date I harvested this much uh, product out of this field, okay. But if you're harvesting this day to take to the market the next day, um, you might want to be a little bit more precise. So, yes, sir. I hate that. Keep asking. No, you're questions. fine. But if we're already maintaining a farm records book to meet our USDA harmonized gap or okay. gap, can we use that same record book? As long as it serves the purpose of how much you're harvesting, yes. Okay. Um, and let me try to speed through this, and then I can answer some questions after okay, after the session. Um, so sales records, uh, you want to record your uh, sales. Um, any storage records and how long you kept the uh, product in storage. Labeling, here's an example of a label. You got your farm name, and then you got your address and then you got certified organic by the Maryland Department of Agriculture below it. This statement right here, certified by Maryland Department of Agriculture, has to be below your name and address. So it's in the standards below. So it has to be below, not beside. And this is for retail products. 
Um, if it's a bulk product, uh, the standards are a little different. Um, attachments to the organic system plan, so your map and showing your buffer. Uh, you want to put how big your buffer is when you draw your map. Uh, you want to put your field sizes and your field identification. So you need your buffers, the size of your buffers, your field sizes, and your field numbers on your map. Uh, field history sheets for the last three years, that's part of the um, initial application. Um, your input, so your, your, oh, uh, you'd want to put down your calcium or your, uh, let's say you were using some chlorine to clean that tractor bucket. You'd put that, like Clorox bleach. Um, that would be on the input sheet. Uh, also your seed list, we'd gone over your seed list, uh, your variety of seeds, your source, the certifier, any treatments, uh, that would be an attachment to your organic system plan. Uh, soil test, um, every three years, just like nutrient management, we'd like to see a soil test to make sure that you're not depleting the soil. Um, labels, and then um, members of the business. Uh, so now we're, this is all um, like the continuing steps of the certification. So we got the initial review. We look over the application, make sure it's complete, that all the uh, attachments were included that are uh, pertinent to your type of business. Um, do the inputs meet the National Organic Program standards? So this would be that calcium. We'd make sure that there wasn't something prohibited in it. Um, if we didn't get enough information, that's when we would ask for additional information before scheduling your inspection. Um, this would probably, this is good for you. Um, the inspection, so we would assign it to an inspector after we have all the information. Um, so the inspector comes out, says, hi, I'm uh, Bill Rawlings. I'll be inspecting you to the National Organic Program Standards today. Um, usually we do the field tours first, get an idea of your operation, uh, look at your input storage, your equipment. Um, we'd verify the inputs and seeds. Um, then we'd go in, preferably go somewhere and sit down and look at your records. Like, we've done it on the hoods of our vans, but that's not the best way to conduct an inspection. Um, so we'd evaluate, evaluate your records, and, uh, complete our inspection report, and then at the end of the inspection is an exit interview. Um, let's say you had all your, all your planting and harvest records, or all your planting and input records, but then you got in the harvest and you just didn't have time Every night it was late night you were harvesting but weren't writing it down. Um, we might say, okay, you didn't have your records for harvest um, in the National Organic Program standards under such and such rule, you're required to keep records pertaining to your production. So we'd, uh, we'd go through uh, what, what issues we found and what, rec uh, what part of the standards pertains to that issue. So. And then you tell us on the spot whether we pass or fail? Uh, we do not determine that. We would, um, we would tell you the issues, and then if it was a big enough issue, if the reviewer just determined it was a big enough issue, you would be issued a noncompliance. So, and that's pretty much, we have the final review, the certification decision, and then some other resources. I think they'll probably uh, post the uh, slides. So you should be able to gather all this from uh, the University of Maryland will send, make this information available to you. Um, if you need any information other than this, we can send you out a packet if anyone would like a beginner packet. So. Is all of that, those slides you just went through real quickly on that, in, in, on that packet? It, this information is, should be available in that packet, yes sir. So, okay. I don't know that we have time for questions. I think we're going to go to the next session now. It's 2 o'clock. Right. Well, let's give Bill a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.